How many of you have enjoyed this series, The Jesus Way? It's been humbling. It's been good. We've been in John chapter 13. We're closing up chapter 13, jumping into 14 uh, this morning. And I just, as I was reading this text, I kept getting these images in my mind of maps. And I was just thinking about just the progression of our society's use of maps. My dad uh, does ministry in the state of Alabama and part of his job would take him all over the highways from Alabama. He would be driving from state to, from city to city doing different ministry in high schools and things like that. And I can remember, uh, we have a picture of like a state map, what that would look like. I can remember he had this, all these maps folded up and they'd be like in the back pockets of the seat and, and he'd pull those maps out and some of them were zoomed in towards more community. Some of, them, some of them were zoomed out where you could see the whole state and then into multiple states. And I can remember him opening these maps and teaching me how to highway hop through the state to get where I needed to go. And, and he would he kind of there would be scribbles of where he would want to go and there'd be some notes on the different maps. And like then you would see people at this this time before we had phones, you'd see people actually driving with like you, we think phones are distracting. Whenever you saw somebody driving with a big old map in front of them, you're like, oh, you better get out of the way because this RV is about to rear end your Civic, okay? Like, and it's gonna ruin your vacation uh, because you're you're looking at this map trying to figure it out and you're looking at road signs and trying not to miss the sign. And that was a day. And then then you would have the moment where you pull up at the gas station and you'd ask a complete stranger for direction. You're like, you're, you know, and you're like, hey, do you know how to get here? And then they would say, yeah, yeah, and they give you landmarks, and they, they, kind of, they, they kind of would direct you there, and you're like, I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to figure this out. And then we had this great invention that changed the world forever, for better or for worse, I'll let you decide, called the Internet, right? And they started to say, what if we put maps on the internet. And anybody remember this site here? That, uh, uh, Michael pulled up these directions to Green Valley High School for me. Uh, this this is called MapQuest. Anybody remember MapQuest? And Kristen was a firm believer in MapQuest. When we were in college, like we didn't have iPhones yet. And so whenever, it, we could just be going to someone's house for dinner and we had a full MapQuest itinerary, okay? And I would always be like, no, no, we don't need the MapQuest. And she's like, you better follow this MapQuest. And you know, at that point, I didn't know how to say yes, dear, so we'd get in a big fight, you know, <laughs> like, and so she pulled out the map quest, and a lot of times the thing is, is it wasn't super updated, so it was wrong, and like, we're flipping through it, right, and then, praise the Lord, we get this, now, like, and uh, come on, everybody just, this is just a, you say what you want about how technology has destroyed our society. This is beautiful, okay? You just follow the blue line, right? And you're going to get where you need to go, right? I was in Tulsa not too long ago speaking to a group of teenagers, and I had a couple hours to kill before I had to be at the airport. And so I was going, I was like being nosy, and there was this church that I'd heard a lot about, and I was going to go try to get like an impromptu tour, and I just like showed up at the church, and the security guard like cut me off at the pass, I was like, I promise I'm not armed, and he like, and, and he's like, no, it's under construction, nobody's, nobody's in there, and I was like, okay, well, here's a more important question than getting a tour of a church. I've heard Tulsa has great barbecue, and I need you to tell me the best barbecue restaurant in Tulsa. And he starts giving me these elaborate directions, and he's like, hey, look, here's what you're going to do. You're going to get on this highway. You're going to pass the Walmart. You're going to take a left at the Jiffy Lube. You're going to see a laundromat. You're going to go past the laundromat. And I'm sitting there thinking the whole time, dude, just tell me the name of the restaurant. I'm going to put it in my phone. <laughs> I'm not looking for a Jiffy Lube and a laundromat. Like, I don't know if this is a drug deal or a lunch site, but like, maybe both. I don't know. But it, it, I just need to know the name because I'm going to put it in my phone. Because here's what we know. This is the most earth-shattering statement that you, you're going to be so glad you came to church today when I put this statement on the screen. You have got to make the right turns to get to the right place. <laughs> Amen? A gasp, collective gasp across the room. This is earth shattering stuff right now. You've got to make, if you make the wrong turns, you will end up in the wrong place. It's just a fact of life. We know this. We, knowing the general direction is not enough to get you to the right destination. In fact, I want to do a little social experiment before we jump right into the word. I want, I want everybody 
uh, to just everybody to close your eyes. And uh, some of you are like, I don't trust you right now, so I'm not closing my eyes. <laughs> or close your eyes. And here's what I want you to do. On the count of three, I want everyone to point north, okay? One, two, three. Point north. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, open your eyes. Look around. Look around. Every, look how many disagreements there are in the room. Like, the sense of direction, if we just follow our sense of direction... By the way, somebody can pull up a compass. I'm pretty sure it's that way, okay? Listen, if we just follow our general sense of direction and we don't know how to navigate life, we are not going to end up at our intended destination. It's just how life works. And the reality is most of our lives are full of wrong turns, but you can look back and prove this. If I had gone to this school, I would have this job. If I had stayed in that relationship, I would have the family I wanted. If I had gotten involved with the group, if I hadn't gotten involved with this group of people, I wouldn't have these regrets. Amen? If we learned anything about the progression of how we get there, it shapes. Where we get is shaped by the turns that we make. And we think about the questions that are most important in our life. All of us ask these questions, and you probably wouldn't even be here if you've never asked yourself this question, but what does it ultimately take for my life, the way that I spend my life, the way that I invest my life, the decisions that I make, what does it ultimately take for me to get to heaven? What does it ultimately take? mean for me to get to the desired destination of my life whatever that looks like whatever you believe about the afterlife whatever you believe about everything there is to experience and this life has to offer what turns do I need to make because general direction will not lead just to navigation to the right place general direction will lead you whichever you'll be go every way that everyone pointed whenever we did our social experiment earlier Everybody has a different hunch on what the right direction is. And the reality is we've got to know the intentional steps and turns that it will take to get us to our desired destination. Because here's the reality. If we can just get heavy just for a moment. We all have this question. What if I don't do the right thing to get the right way to get to the right place? And at the end of the day, if I'm standing at the entrance of heaven. Why would God let me in? Have I made the right choices? Have I made the right turns? Have I done the right things in my life to navigate me into the place that I want to be for eternity? Have I done what it takes to get where I want to go? Or am I just following my gut? Am I just doing, am I just hoping that this is right? And I want us all to walk out of here this morning with more than just an empty hope, with more than just a, a, a hopeful prayer. I want us to walk out of here, like we just sang in that song, with confidence about the direction that we're taking. Jesus starts giving instructions to his disciples. And as he's giving these instructions in John chapter 13, they start to realize and pick up on things, something. He's, he's about to leave. <laughs> like he's telling us these things because he's about to leave us. And so they start to kind of freak out. You know, when the person who knows where they're going and you've been following them starts to leave, when the leader leaves, people start to freak out. Why? Because they're depending on that person for their direction. And so they start to kind of have these panic moments in John chapter 13. And he lands the plane right here in verse 35 that we, where we talked about last week. He says, listen, this is how people will know. In other words, this is what you're supposed to do. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. If you love one another. And then comes the questions. And they're like, yeah, yeah that's great. <laughs> but I got I got." questions, right? Anybody ever give you a big lofty thought and you're like, okay, that sounds really good, but I've got some like detailed questions that you need to fill in the blanks, right? And so they've got some questions and Simon Peter, one of his disciples said to him, he said, Lord, like one question, where are you going? (laughs) 
Like, like wh- where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Which is like, what? <laughs> huh? Like, and, and he speaks to a tension that Peter has probably in his heart, and a lot of the, the disciples are probably frustrated by this answer. I know I would be, because it's like, I want to know where I'm going right now, and I want to know, if you're saying you're going to a good place, I want to go with you. And he's like, where I'm going, you can't actually follow me, but you will follow afterward. We hate waiting, don't we? We hate it. We hate when we have a dream in our heart and God makes us wait for the fruit. Well, we hate when we have something we're pursuing in our marriage. This is why we. Pr- this is why I wanted our hearts to be prepared in our prayer time earlier, because if we can see what God wants for our life, then why does He make us wait to have it? And He looks at Peter and He's like, "Listen, where I'm going, you can't go, but you'll come there later." Verse thirty-seven. So Peter responds. He says. Lord, why can't I follow you? Somebody say it. Why can't I follow you now? I want it now. I will lay my life down for you. Listen, Peter does what we all love to do. God, look what I can do. Listen, I got a lot to give. I promise you, let's go do this thing. And I, I won't disappoint you. I will lay my life down for you. I've got you. Like Peter is full. Uh, It's not necessarily confidence as much as I believe it's ambition. And this isn't to downplay Peter's enthusiasm. This is actually just to help us relate to Peter. It's like we're all enthusiastic about the things God's put in our heart, but we're not willing to wait for him to actually work it out in our life. And Peter is expressing this enthusiasm. He's like, this is what I can do. Give me the promotion. Give me the raise. Give me the opportunity. Give me the resources. Give me the relationship. Why? And I won't let you. I'm going to let me out. When, I, when you give it to me, I'll do it for you. Right? And Jesus is like, I actually already told you what you do. You love one another, and that's how people are going to know me. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what is, what is the fun stuff today? I saw a, a, a um, TikTok, but it was a real because I don't have the TikTok app. I saw it on Instagram. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Everybody over 30 does. <laughs> and so I see this reel on Instagram this week, and it's the, this, the, this girl, she's like, she's like, it is literally impossible to get eight hours of sleep. I mean, I just don't know what to do. I cannot get eight hours of sleep. And they're like, well, what if you go to bed eight hours before you got to get up? And she's like, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> We're not willing to do what we need to do to get where we're actually trying to go. And Peter's like, listen, I know you said love one another, but I'll lay my life down for you. And Jesus answered him. He said, will you? Will you really lay your life down for me? Truly, I'll tell you this. You know, as a parent, we know a lot of times that our kids make promises that they can't deliver on, right? Cannon was trying to tr- convince me to go to the trampoline park one day, and like we didn't have enough time to go to the trampoline park. And he's like, Dad, I'll give you a thousand dollars. I'm like, Dude, if you have a thousand dollars, I'm gonna slap you upside the head because I like I don't know where that is. Like, you don't have a thousand dollars, bro. And, and Jesus, in the same level of understanding his child right now, he's like, Will you lay your life down for me? Will you really do that? Truly, truly, I say to you, this is what's going to happen. The rooster won't even crow until you've denied me three times. We are notorious for writing checks our character can't cash. We're notorious for writing checks that our character can't cash. And Peter, in his enthusiasm and his passion, is overlooking the direction that Jesus has told him to take. He's overlooking the turn. The turn was not to look up at this point. The turn was to look left and to look right, to love one another so that the world could see Jesus. That was the direction and the instruction that he gave him. And he's like, no, 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 no. I want to do, I'll lay my life down for you. And he's like, will you do it? Will you really? Because you're actually going to get an opportunity soon whenever I'm arrested. You're going to get an opportunity to do that and you're actually going to deny me. And now remember, Jesus had just done this at the table with Judas. He had just showed John and Peter, hey, Judas is going to be the one who denies me. And now he's telling Peter, listen, 
you're actually going to deny me as well. Judas will betray me, and now you're going to deny me. What is he showing them? Listen, we're notorious for writing checks our character cannot cash. And what you will not hear me say today, listen, listen, this is very important. You will not hear me say today is that you've got to write this astronomical check for God before he will let you in to the kingdom. That's not what he's asking from you. That's not what he's, he's not asking for you to write a check that you can't cash. In fact, he's trying, he's begging, he's pleading, he's trying to talk to the disciples and saying, listen, you're, you don't have much to give. You're actually going to betray me. You're actually going to deny me. Jesus is illustrating the reality as our loyalty is limited by our character. But here's Jesus' response. I love this. Chapter 14, verse 1. He says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. You know that feeling you get in your stomach when you let somebody down? That, that feeling you get? And he's saying, listen, listen, you're going to let me down. That's okay. My goal for you is that you would be so focused on me that you can be no longer worried about you. Don't let your hearts be troubled by this. Peter, you're going to deny me, dude. You're going to royally mess up <laughs> like you are. But don't let your heart be troubled by that. Is that a permission slip to sin? No. It's a recognition that we are sinners. And he's like, listen, it's not going to be in your achievement that you enter into the kingdom of heaven. You're not going to achieve your way or buy your way into the kingdom of heaven. No, listen, don't let your hearts be troubled. You already believe in God. Believe in me. I've showed you. Jesus is like, I've showed you that I'm God. I've showed you that my touch heals. I've showed you that my word brings life. I've showed you that I multiply and provide. I've showed you who I am. You believe in God. Believe now in me, my goal for you is that you be so focused on me. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. Jesus' goal for you today, friends, listen. Jesus' goal for you today is that you would be so focused on him that you would be no longer worried about you. Jesus' goal for you today is that you would be so focused on him that you would no longer be worried about you. You would be so focused on Jesus today that you would no longer be worried about today's problems. Here's what he says. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me because this is what I'm going to do. Verse two, my father's house has many rooms. My father's house, it's, it's big. It's got a lot of rooms, a lot of space. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Listen, look, don't miss this. We write checks our character can't cash, but Jesus always has enough bank to clear. He always has enough in the bank to clear the checks he writes to us. He, he's like, I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to prepare a place for you when it's not even there. I'm not going to make a pro an empty promise to you. What I'm telling you is you, there's empty rooms for you. I, I have a place for you. It's big. I wouldn't have told you that if it's not true. Verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. In other words, this, when Jesus walks out forward towards the mission, he accomplishes it every time. He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Jesus is giving them a glimpse into heaven. He's giving them a glimpse into what is to come. He's saying, listen, my father's house is full of rooms. My father's house has many rooms, and I'm going now to prepare a place for you. Jesus, in this moment, is getting ready to be crucified on the cross. Because of Judas' betrayal, the Pharisees will surround him. The religious leaders, they're going to come and they're going to they're collect Jesus. They're going to put him on a trial that they rigged. And they're going to accuse him of things that, quite honestly, he didn't do. They're going to nail him to a cross and he's going to be crucified and put in a grave. And then three days later... God the Father will raise him, listen, this is very important, will raise him from the dead, and he will ascend back to his throne with the Father in heaven. 
This is the good news of the gospel. Jesus came down. He lived the life we couldn't live. And he died the death we deserved to die. And he went up to heaven. He's saying, what I'm going to do is prepare a place for you. My father's house has many rooms. But listen, it's not many rooms. This isn't, this isn't like uh, an Airbnb that you rent that's got stock photos and you know, just generalized decorations. This isn't just an empty shell of a room or a hotel suite where you just go in. And these are rooms with your name on them. I, I love Kristen's creativity as the kids grow up. She just, our room, their rooms are always evolving. And so Kristen, my wife, she'll, like whenever the kids are into a show, she might draw a piece of artwork that has to go with that show or she'll order them a specific poster that they can put up in a frame and their rooms are always evolving based on their personalities and what they love. Why? Because she's a mother who knows her children and she personalizes their rooms and she loves when they walk into their rooms and they feel joy in their heart and they actually enjoy their room. Why? It's a space that is created for them. It's got their name on it. It doesn't even have to have their name written on it because it all it encompasses everything that they care about and love. He is going to prepare a room that you're going to love to be in. This isn't just, you're not renting. You're not just there for a little while. This is, he's going to prepare a special place for a special person that he made in his image, you. He's going to prepare this place for you. Listen, this is important. Write this down. Jesus doesn't lead us to an empty room where we can stay. He prepares a room where we belong. He doesn't lead us to an empty room where we can just crash for the night. We're not crashing on the house, on the couch, in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, we're, we're, not, we're not, he's not getting the guest sheets out for us. This is a room for you. Because you're his child and he's your father. A prepared a place for you to belong. Jesus doesn't lead us to an empty room where we can stay. He prepares a room where we belong. Listen, but look, he doesn't lead us. He doesn't leave us to navigate our way to heaven by ourselves. He said, I will come back and take you with me. But Thomas misses the point. Thomas, he says, Jesus says, he completes his thought. He says, you know the way to the place where I'm going, which they're thinking, no, I don't. I don't know the way yet. (laughs) I don't know the way to this place. Verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? We don't know where you're going. So how in the world can we know the way? Thomas missed the point. Jesus said, I will come back and take you with me. Listen, this is the difference in somebody pointing and giving you directions. There's a difference in somebody getting you directions and somebody coming to pick you up. Right? If I'm trying to follow somebody through traffic or I'm trying to follow and and remember, okay, i got to pass the Kmart and then take a ride at the Jiffy Lube and look behind the laundromat, I'm going to miss the barbecue joint. But if somebody says, hey, get in the car with me, I'm going to take you to this destination, that's what Jesus is saying he's going to do. He's like, look, I'm giving you some basic instructions of what I want you to do and how I want you guys to operate, how I want you guys to love one another. But here's what you need to know. When it comes to arriving, to the kingdom gates of heaven you do not have to live in any sort of doubt that you're going to get to the right destination i'm going to pick you up and take you to the gates i'm going to pick you up and take you there i'm coming back to get you but thomas wasn't listening you already know the way to heaven here's what he's saying you already know the way to heaven why because you know me You know the way to heaven when you know Jesus. Jesus answered him, verse 6. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. The Jesus way is really a simple way. The Jesus way is not complicated directions. It's not a hidden road sign. It's not old highways. The Jesus way is very crystal clear. Is that he is the way. The way of Jesus is not a map. It's an invitation. 
The way of Jesus isn't confusing directions with landmarks that we can't see. The way of Jesus is an invitation into his vehicle. It doesn't rely on our performance. It relies on his accomplishments. It relies on who he is. And so Jesus is looking at his disciples. He's like, listen, I know you don't really understand what I'm saying, but you know where we're going and you know how to get there. Why? Because you know me. You know me. There's a missiologist and a church leader by the name of David Platt. I love how he explains this. He was visiting in another country and a couple of guys were visiting with him outside of a temple of other religions and they're all explaining their different religions and uh, how they go about achieving salvation and as they're unpacking it he says that you know really what if I'm if I'm hearing you guys right what you're saying is that you know you're saying that all of our religions are simply or essentially the same that we're all kind of go after the same goal in different ways right and they're like yeah yeah, we're all kind of going to the same place in different ways. And he's like, it's almost like there, there, that God is, is at the top of a mountain, and there's all these paths up the mountain that are, are leading up to God. And they're like, yes, that's, that's, you, you got it. Like, you hear it. And the only problem with that and what's, what's different about Christianity and what's different about Jesus is Jesus does not wait for us to find our way up the mountain to him. Jesus came from the top of the mountain and came down to the bottom to get us. That's the Jesus way. It's not a confusing path through trails and tribulations that we have to navigate and just hope that we're going the right way and just hope by our gut that we're following in the right place. No, no, no. Jesus doesn't wait for us to find our way to him. Jesus came down to get us. That is the Jesus way. Islam says follow these five pillars and make your way up to him and maybe you'll be good enough. Atheism or agnosticism says follow yourself. You're really your own God. Hinduism says break the cycle of karma through good deeds and uh, achieve moksha. Buddhism says achieve nirvana through more knowledge. And These are all paths to get up to God. And the problem is I'm not telling you there's a path that you're able to travel to get to God. But what I'm telling you is that he made a clear highway when he came down to get you. And the reason he cared so much to come get you is because he has a room with your name on it. With your favorite things. In the most life-giving way. He even knows like your favorite essential oil. And he put it in the diffuser. <laughs> he, he made it just for you because he prepares a place for his children. Because why? We're not just crashing for the night heaven is a home where we live for a lifetime we live for all eternity as I invite the band to come up I just I want to make this very clear Jesus if you miss everything else today do not miss this Jesus made his way to us because we could not make our way to him it's not just that there aren't a lot of ways up to heaven. It's that we couldn't make it if there were. That sin stands in the way of us making our way to Jesus. And the Jesus way is that because the Joseph way is never going to be good enough. <laughs> I, I'm never going to be able to make my way up to God, but he made his way down to me and today I think there's some of us in the room and maybe some of you online that you've been trying to make your way up to God you're just hoping you're just crossing your fingers and you're just thinking maybe if I do a couple of good things maybe if I give or maybe if I show up or maybe if I'm nice to people God will let me into heaven And the question that we started our morning with, it's like, what, what's it going to take? If you're standing at the gates of heaven, what's it going to take for him to let you in? It's, it's not going to be what you did for God. It's not going to be what you gave. It's not going to be what you did because all of that is marred by sin. 
your pride, your selfishness, your lust, your gossip. Our sin stands in the way of us getting into heaven. But when Jesus put on human clothes and he moved into our neighborhood, he lived the life we couldn't live. He lived without sin. And when he looked at his disciples and he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, the first step of that journey was to go die on the cross for them, for us. And what he did when he died on the cross is he paid the price that we could have never afford, the check that would have always bounced, cleared. The check that our character couldn't cash, his could. And he wrote that check and that debt is paid. And right now, the moment that you need to have with Jesus is I, I'm acknowledging that you paid for my sin. I'm repenting. I'm turning from it. Why? Not because I'm going to earn my way back to heaven, but because I realize I could never earn my way to heaven. And I want to experience your love. And I just want you to picture, Just you might want to close your eyes and just picture this moment. Or you're standing at the gates of heaven asking the question why would God let me in why would he let you into heaven and the answer is he shouldn't he shouldn't let me in Colossians 3 Paul paints this picture for us I want you to just listen to these, this verse picture yourself standing at the gates of heaven he says for you have died And your life is hidden with Christ in God. So that when Christ, who is your life, appears, when he comes back to get you, not when he sends you a pin, not when he tells you to highway hop, not when he gives you broken directions, not when you're looking for a landmark you can't find and wondering if you did the right thing the right way to get to the right place. No, when he comes back to get you, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. You know the way to heaven because you know Jesus. You're good enough to get into heaven because Jesus has clothed you. He is covering you. Your life is hidden inside of him. So every mistake that you think, every wrong turn that you've taken, that you think won't, will keep you from getting to the right destination, will keep you from getting to heaven, can all be covered when you're found in who Jesus is. Jesus made his way to you because you couldn't make your your way to him. So here's the question. Is your life hidden with Christ in God? Is your life hidden with Christ in God? As we worship here in a moment, there's going to be two different responses that I want to call you to make. One, for those of you who you've given your life to Jesus, you realize he is the only way to heaven. Yes, it's because Jesus, yes, I've given my life. But you know what you struggle with? You struggle with making someone else your truth. You struggle with making other things your life. And this needs to be your prayer today. If you've given your life to Jesus, and and as soon as I say amen here in a moment, you may need to just make this stage an altar and kneel or make your seat an altar and just pray or go find someone that's going to be in the back of the room. But here needs to be your prayer. Jesus, you are my foundation for truth, and you are my source of life. You're my foundation for truth, and you're my source of life. And here's the question, where do you seek truth that is not rooted in Jesus? Worldly wisdom, news outlets, your friends' opinions, approval of others, what provides the truth, the sustenance of your life? So if you've given your life to Jesus, this message is very much for you. Don't think like, okay, I, I've already I've already prayed a prayer, I've already been baptized, I've already done all that. So this isn't this is for you. This is still for you. This is for me today. We need to anchor ourselves in his truth. 
And then there's those of you, you've never prayed to receive Christ. You've never said, Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And I want to read this prayer, and then I'm going to lead us in a time where you can pray this, maybe for the first time. I've just written this out. We're going to put it on the screen. Jesus, today I choose your way. If you've never given your life to Jesus, this is your prayer today. And maybe you've believed in Jesus, but remember, Jesus looked at his disciples. He said, listen, you believe in God, now also believe in me. Just believing that there is a God is not what we're talking about. Believing that Jesus is the only way to heaven is what we're talking about. Jesus, today I choose your way. I confess that I'm a sinner. I, I need you to save me. Thank you for making your way to me when I could not make my way to you. I trust you today for my salvation. I believe in my heart that you died on the cross for my sin and the Father raised you to life on the third day. Today I turn from my sin, confess you as Lord of my life, and walk into that new life with you. So here's what I'm going to do. Right now, every head bowed and every eye closed, unless you need to read this off the screen. And that's if you need to do that, look at the screen. I want to give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus today. In a moment, we're going to have baptisms. You might feel... The God tugging you to be baptized today. But first, you need to confess that Jesus is Lord of your life. No matter how spiritual you've ever been, if you've never confessed that Jesus is Lord of your life, today is the day to do that. So I'm going to lead you in these prompts and you repeat after me if you've never done this before and you want to make Jesus Lord of your life today. And a spirit of prayer all across the room. Maybe just open your hands toward heaven, wherever you're at, if you're a believer or not. Say, Jesus, today I choose your way. I confess that I'm a sinner. I need you to save me. Thank you for making your way to me when I couldn't make my way to you. I trust you today for my salvation. I believe in my heart that you died on the cross for my sin. I believe the Father raised you to life on the third day. On today, I turn from my sin, confess you as Lord of my life, and walk in a new life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, with every head bowed and every eye closed across the room, just you and your moment with God, just every head bowed, every eye closed across the room. If you prayed that for the very first time, would you just slip your hand up? I don't see hands all over the room. If you prayed that for the very first time, just slip your hand up. It's amazing. your invitation I'm going to pray and as we begin to sing if you prayed that for the very first time or maybe you need prayer in your life there's going to be some ministry leaders at the end of each aisle I want you as soon as everyone stands to their feet I want you to make your way to those ministry leaders and say I gave my life to Jesus I gave my life to Jesus so I'm going to pray If God moved on your heart, you prayed to receive Christ, we want to help you walk in that next step. You obey as God leads. Jesus, we want to thank you for saving. Jesus, we love you. And we just acknowledge that you are powerful. We acknowledge that you are able. God, we give you praise right now in this place for salvation. Come on, somebody give him praise right now in this room for salvation, for new life, for victory, for not having to be confused, knowing if we're going the right way. We all made mistakes. We're all making mistakes. We're all going to continue to fall short, but our life is hidden with Christ and God who is our life. And when we appear with him, we appear in glory because we're found in Jesus. So let's stand to our feet all across this room. Let's stand to our feet and we're going to sing because the Son has set us free. We are free in Jesus.
deed. In Jesus' name we pray, you move as God leads you to move. Amen.